Most Holy Father, we welcome you to St. Charles Boros Mayo Seminary, which was your home three years ago when you, you attended the 41st International Eucharistic Congress. The New York Archdiocese in Brooklyn chipped off one hour of your schedule First time anybody obeyed me. I'm not going to prolong the time, and I won't. And I won't say that I'm going to be brief. But this seminary traces its origins to 1,832. In 1838, the legislature of Pennsylvania issued a charter authorizing the seminary to grant the highest degrees. Seven years later, in 1845, Pope St. Gregory, which one was it? The 16th. <laughs> authorized this seminary to grant doctoral degrees. I don't know whether they've ever found a candidate that was worthy of it yet. <laughs> and we ha even today we have to do the best with what's available and this is That's the best. But beyond the seminarians is a representative group of Philadelphians, both Catholic and non-Catholic, marvelous people, great people. Our only regret is that we weren't, because of limitations of space, to invite more of them. But we present them to you, Your Holiness. And now there's only one thing. I have to apologize for the apparent uh, undisciplined behavior of our seminarians. <laughs> And I know of no better way to demonstrate to Your Holiness how well they can behave under different circumstances. And I suggest, Your Holiness, it's a long-standing tradition. When we have a cardinal, there are certain benefits, fringe benefits, given with it. But when we have a pope, I suggest, Your Holiness, a triduum of free days. I present the faculty, the administrative staff, the student body, and a representative group of Philadelphia to Your Holiness.
Estreída, estreída, estreída. Your Eminence, thank you very much for this marvelous introduction. Now I shall read you this official paper. <laughs> and after this official paper, I'll, I, I shall say you something supplementary. <laughs> One of the things I wanted most to do during my visit to the United States has now arrived. I wanted to visit a seminary and meet seminarians, of course, the seminary of St. Charles and seminarian of St. Charles in Philadelphia. <laughs> and through you, I would like to communicate to all seminarians how much you mean to me and how much you mean for the future of the church, for the future of the mission given to us by Christ. You hold a special place in my thoughts and prayers. In your lives there is great promise for the future of evangelization. And you give us hope that the authentic renewal of the Church, which was begun with, by the Second Vatican Council, will be brought to fruition. But in order for this to happen, you must receive a solid and well-rounded preparation in the seminary. This personal conviction about the importance of seminaries prompted me to write these words in my Holy Thursday letter to the bishops of the Church. The full reconstitution of the life of the seminaries throughout the Church will be the best proof of the achievement of the renewal to which the Council directed the Church. And if seminaries are to fulfill their mission in the Church, two activities in the overall program of the seminary are crucially important. The teaching of God's Word and discipline, the intellectual formation of the priest, which is so vital for the times 
in which we live embraces a number of the human sciences as well as the various sacred sciences. These all have an important place in your preparation for the priesthood. But the first priority for seminaries today is the teaching of God's Word in all its purity and integrity, with all its demands and in all its power. This was clearly affirmed by my beloved predecessor, Paul VI, when he stated that sacred scriptures is a perpetual source of spiritual life, the chief instrument for handling down Christian doctrine and the center of all theological study. Therefore, if you, the seminarians of this generation, are to be adequately, adequately prepared to take on the heritage and challenge of the Second Vatican Council, you will need to be well trained in the Word of God. Secondly, the seminary must provide a sound discipline to prepare for a life of consecrated service in the image of Christ. Its purpose was well defined by the Second Vatican Council. The discipline required by seminary life should not be regarded merely as a strong support of community life and of charity. For it is a necessary part of the whole training program designed to provide self-mastery, to foster solid maturity of personality, and to develop other traits of character which are extremely serviceable for the ordered and productive, productive activity of the Church. When discipline is properly exercised, it can create an atmosphere of recollection which enables the seminarian to develop interiorly those attitudes which are so desirable in a priest, such as joyful obedience, generosity, and self-sacrifice. In the different forms of community life that are appropriate for the seminary, you will learn the art of dialogue, the capacity to listen to others, and to discover the richness of their personality, and the ability to give of yourself Seminary discipline will reinforce rather than diminish your freedom for it will help develop in you those traits and attitudes of mind and heart which God has given you and which enrich your humanity and help you to serve more effectively his people. Discipline will also assist you in ratifying day after day in your hearts the obedience you owe to Christ and his church. I want to remind you of the importance of fidelity. Before you can be ordained, you are called by Christ to make a free and irrevocable commitment to be faithful to him and to his church. Human dignity requires that you maintain this commitment, that you keep your promise to Christ, 
no matter what difficulties you may encounter, and no matter what temptations you may be exposed to. The seriousness of this irrevocable commitment places a special obligation upon the rector and faculty of the seminar, and in a particular way on the spiritual director to help you to evaluate your own suitability for ordination. It is then the responsibility of the bishop to judge whether you should be called to the priesthood. It is important that one's commitment be made with full awareness and personal freedom. And so, during these years in the seminar, take time to reflect on the serious obligations and the difficulties which are part of the priest's life. Consider whether Christ is calling you to the celibate life. You can make a responsible decision for celibacy only after you have reached the firm conviction that Christ is indeed offering you this gift, which is intended for the good of the Church and for the service of others. To understand what it means to be faithful, you we, we must look to Christ, the faithful witness, the Son who learned to obey through what he suffered. To Jesus who said, My aim is to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. We look to Jesus not only to see and contemplate his fidelity to the Father despite all opposition, but also to learn from him the means he employed in order to be faithful, especially prayer and abandonment to God's will. Remember that in the final analysis, perseverance in fidelity is a proof not of human strength and courage, but of the efficacy of Christ's grace. And so, if we are going to persevere, we shall, we shall have to be men of prayer, who, through the Eucharist, the liturgy of the hours, and our personal encounters with Christ, find the courage and grace to be faithful. Let us be confident, then, remembering the words of St. Paul, there is nothing that I cannot master with the help of the one who gives me the strength. My brothers and sons in Christ, keep in mind the priorities of the priesthood to which you aspire, namely prayer and the ministry of the world. It is the prayer that shows the essential style of the priest. Without prayer, this style becomes deformed. Prayer helps us always to find the light that has led us since the beginning of our priestly vocation and which never ceases to lead us. Prayer enables us to be converted continually 
to remain in a state of continuous reaching out to God, which is essential if we wish to lead others to Him. Prayer helps us to believe, to hope, and to love. It is my hope that during your years in the seminary, you will develop an ever greater hunger for the Word of God. Meditate on this Word daily and study it continually so that your whole life may become a proclamation of Christ, the Word made flesh. In this Word of God, are the beginning and end of all ministry, the purpose of all pastoral activity, the rejuvenating source for faithful perseverance, and the one thing which can give meaning and unity to the varied activities of a priest. Let the message of Christ of Christ, in all its richness, find a home with you. In the knowledge of Christ, you have the key to the gospel. In the knowledge of Christ, you have an understanding of the needs of the world. Since he became one with us in all things but sin, your union with Jesus of Nazareth could never and will never be an obstacle to understanding and responding to the needs of the world. And finally, in the knowledge of Christ, you will not only discover and come to understand the limitations of human wisdom, and of human solutions to the needs of humanity, but you will also experience the power of Jesus and the value of human reason and human endeavor when they are taken up in the strength of Jesus, when they are redeemed in Christ. May our Blessed Mother Mary protect you today and always. May I also take this opportunity to greet the lay people who are present today at St. Charles Seminary. Your presence here is a sign of your esteem for the ministerial priesthood as well as being a reminder of that close cooperation between laity and priests which is needed if the mission of Christ is to be fulfilled in our time. I am happy that you are present and I am grateful for all that you do for the Church in Philadelphia. In particular, I ask you to pray for these young men and for all seminarians that they may persevere in their calling. Please pray for all priests and for the success of their ministry among God's people. And please pray the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into his vineyard, the church.
thank you, not only for those powerful and incisive words, but more importantly, for the example of living those words and giving us a model of how to meet our commitments to Christ. His Holiness will now impart a blessing, and since he is still trying to catch up what was lost in New York and other places, out of deference and love for him, we'll ask him to impart his blessing and put him right to bed if we can. Before the blessing, I am obliged to say you something what, what is out of this official reading. And so I must say you, my good opinion, good reputation in this seminary is saved. You know, I am here, my visit here is for the third time, for the third time. The first time I came here ten years ago as a young cardinal. <laughs> introduced by your cardinal. And after, after this visit, I gained a good reputation. <laughs> when when I, I came for the second time in 76 for the Eucharistic Congress, some of your of your predecessors, now they are priests, say to me that I have gained a, a good reputation. <laughs> After my visit, they obtained one or two days off. Hearing at the beginning what you, your cardinal said to you, <clears throat> I was obliged to say to myself, my reputation is safe. was one day or two, one day off, and now, as I heard, it will be three.
and what I must add, I see that also your superiors, also your superiors, are rather content about for this decision. Rather, rather in accordance, non in opposition. Nomen Domini Benedictum. Adiutorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen.